If your name is Tan Yu or Tipawan, and you live on a canal in Bangkok, Thailand, then your ice cream man is an ice cream lady in a large straw hat and a small boat. And coconut ice cream is only one of the joys we'll share in just a minute as Discovery goes to Thailand. Discovery 68, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, welcome to Discovery. Today we've come to the most fortunate of all the rice countries of Southeast Asia, Thailand, a beautiful and bountiful place that used to be called Siam. Rice is so important here that in the Thai language, the phrase for to be hungry means literally to be hungry for rice. But when you're hungry here, you don't stay that way very long. Seventeen people live in this handmade teakwood house in Bangkok, Thailand. They are all members of the family of one man, Suan Putichat. Just now, they're settling in for the first meal of the day. Many Thais eat just two meals a day, breakfast and supper. Although in between, they eat an incredible variety of snacks, consisting of everything from spiced meats to fried bananas to lotus seeds. This is a normal breakfast. But it looks like a full-color magazine spread on the foods of Thailand. There's bamboo shoot curry, fish paste, fish soup, eggs fried two ways, fresh pineapple, crab, pork, and as always, rice. All of it, fish, meat, and rice, is shared out among Suan's sons and his daughters, their husbands and wives, and their children, Suan's grandchildren. Some members of Suan's family go to work in the city, like his daughter, Tomak, and his son, Tawi. With so many small children around, this house will begin to resemble a day nursery once the parents have gone off to their jobs. But there are still plenty of adults to take care of the small fry, because this family is, in one sense, two families. Thirty years ago, Suan came here and married both of the daughters of the family who lived in this house. Nowadays, young Thais have only one wife, and the old custom of polygamy, having more than one wife, is officially discouraged by the government. But Suan lives in peace and comfort in the midst of his large family, including his own mother, Puang, who is 90 years old. Whatever Su Wan and his family do, they do by water, because this canal, called a Klong in Thai, is all the front road their house and their neighbors' houses have. Su Wan built most of his house by hand, just as he dug the side canals he uses to irrigate his gardens. Water is everything here. Among other things, it's the path to the schoolhouse for the youngsters in the family who are old enough to go to school. Tan Yu, Su Wan's youngest child, is 10. Tipawan, who is seven, is the daughter of Tanyu's brother, Tawi. So Tanyu is Tipawan's aunt. They go to the same school, in the same boat, wearing the same blue and white uniforms. School is compulsory in Thailand through the fourth grade, but many youngsters go further. Tan Yu is in the third grade at the Wat Mahabud School. 94% of all Thais are practicing Buddhists. And on their way to school, Tan Yu and Tipawan pass three other neighborhood Wats, or Buddhist temples. Until recently, all education in Thailand was in the hands of the Buddhist monks, but today the government has taken over the schools to a large degree. Since most of the schools are still located in or near Wats, Young Thais are exposed to their country's gentle, serene national religion from their earliest days. In their saffron-colored robes, the Buddhist monks are everywhere in Thailand, and some don't look much older than Tanyu and Tipawan. And with good reason, almost all young Thai boys become Buddhist monks for short and sometimes long periods of time. Some of them are just 14 years old, just a few years older than Tipawan's Aunt Tanya.
While the youngsters are at school, the eldest sons and daughters of Suwan Putachat are on their way to jobs in the city. Suwan himself is setting about the work he's done since he was a boy. Like almost all of his countrymen, Suwan is a farmer, though he lives in the city of Bangkok. For the most part, Suwan raises fruit trees, papaya, coconut, and mango, and these bananas, which he'll cut and take to market this morning. Like almost everything else he does, Suwan will market his produce by boat. He goes to the market to sell whenever he feels he has enough to make the trip worthwhile. While Suwan is preparing his boat in the side clong, some of the market is approaching out in front. The things the family buys are naturally those things they do not raise or make themselves. Since they raise no vegetables, they patronize the vegetable boat, which passes their house every morning. Traditionally, the Thais raise fruit, while the Chinese farmers, who make up a large portion of the Thai community, raise vegetables. It's the women's job to look after the selection of the vegetables that will go into the family's cooking. This lady is selling vegetables that are familiar to all of us. Tomatoes, cucumbers, cauliflower, and lettuce. Vegetables can be bought early in the week to last through several days cooking. But because there's no refrigeration, meat and fresh fish are bought each day for that day's use. Buddhism forbids the killing of any living creature. But long before the arrival of Buddhism in Thailand, the Thais lived on a diet of fish and meat prepared with the basis of rice. Buddhism compromised and declared, for example, that man didn't really kill the fish, but merely removed it from its watery environment and placed it in an airy one, where the fish died of its own accord. This sort of adjustment, arrived at centuries ago, enables today's Thai women to provide their families with a balanced diet without violating their religious principles. If there's a single key to life in Thailand, it's flexibility. The precepts of Buddhism bend to accommodate Thai customs. In Suwan's house, the first meal of the day is served at 9 a.m., more or less. Suwan goes to the market with his produce, when he goes, in the morning if he feels like it. When the crop is cut and the boat loaded, he's ready to go. But if he comes out of the side clong and finds the coffee vendor at his doorstep, and he feels like a glass of good, strong coffee made on the spot, he stops, and the marketing can wait a few minutes. Suwan runs his life. He doesn't trot along after it. That movement, hands folded and raised before the face, is the traditional Thai signal of greeting. It's called a Y. It signifies respect and indicates the beginning or ending of a conversation. Sawad di, Jenny. Sawad di. Not quite everything comes up the clong to their doorsteps, so once in a while when Suan goes to the floating market to sell his produce, his family goes along to buy the things they can't get at home. What could you buy there? Well, how about incense and betel nut ointment? or fried bananas and curry chicken, or boiled insects and barbecued lizards. We'll see you there in just a minute. This is Bangkok's famous floating market. Here, every morning of the year, buyers and sellers come together in an endless flotilla of small boats. There's a the coffee vendor with his blocks of ice nested in rice husks to keep them from melting in the broiling Bangkok sun and his snacks of fried rice cakes and peanuts. There's the fish boat, Jenny. And the boat lady with fresh fruits and vegetables.
trip to the floating market is a break in the week's routine of taking the boat to school and taking the boat home again. It means seeing things they don't see every day and being around more people than they're used to and eating fried bananas. For many of the people here, the floating market is a way of life. For Tanyu and Tipawan, it's a treat. Apart from holidays and special times when the whole city becomes a festival, there's only one thing they like better than the floating market. And that's what people in Bangkok call the Sunday market. The Sunday market begins on Saturday morning for the people who come here to buy things or just to eat and walk and talk and enjoy each other's company. For the people who come to sell, it all began on Friday night when most of them set up their stands and unloaded their wares then slept on the ground in order to be sure of an early start Saturday morning. In the Sunday market, there is more of everything than anywhere else in Bangkok. There are more kinds of fish for sale, cooked, raw, smoked, and squirming, than you could find in the fish boats on the Klon. There are frogs here, and eels, and snakes, and insects, which children collect and boil to make into a special seasoning that they put on rice and vegetables. Many Thai fruits are unfamiliar to us. It's easy enough to recognize a mango or even a papaya once you've seen one. But some Thai fruits make the mango look as common as an apple or a peach. This is called a rambutan. Looks something like a sea urchin from the outside, covered with long, flexible, thorn-like spines. But once you get to the inside, it's sweet and moist, something like a large grape. And this is a mangosteen. The ties cut them open and scoop out the meat of the fruit with a fork. And this is the most expensive of all Thai fruits. It's called a durian. It's also one that Thais think Westerners don't like very much. It has a strong odor. It smells something like cheese. Mm, it also tastes something like a mild cheese. Nature has provided Thailand with a tremendous variety of food. And the Thais have responded by devising a seemingly endless number of ways of preparing it. Most Thais are fond of light snacks. Meeting on the street between friends is likely to lead to a sidewalk restaurant. But not everything in the Sunday market is for the dinner table. If you're looking for a pet, you'll find it here. Maybe it's a long-armed monkey called a gibbon. Or a tree squirrel or another monkey. The Thais love animals and will not hunt them or kill them or cause them pain. The monks, for example, strain their drinking water lest they accidentally swallow an insect and thereby kill it. Since Buddhists believe that one of the most virtuous things they can do is release caged birds or animals, there are men in the Sunday market who sell small sparrows called rice birds. The people buy them in small wicker cages with the sole intention of taking them into the fields and releasing them, thereby earning what Buddhists call merit or credit for good works and kind deeds. It costs Tanyu and Tipawan about a dollar to buy a rice bird and a cage. They may keep the bird a while as a pet and then release it, gaining merit and losing a treasure. We'll be back in just a minute. Suan's family live only a bus ride from the market grounds. But most of their days are largely spent within their home, playing, talking, or helping prepare the evening meal. For Ta Wee, the shirt and trousers he wears to work quickly give way to the traditional garment of men in Thailand. A piece of fabric called a pakama, a garment of many windings. Something like a sarong. Useful, versatile, and cool. In a Thai household, child care is everybody's business. Tanyu, the ten-year-old aunt, has half a dozen nieces and nephews to shepherd. 
Tawi has his own seven-month-old baby. The hanging swing in which he rocks his daughter has held the family's children for 30 years. It's a house that's well looked after. It's also a house that has ghosts or spirits. But then so does every Thai home, which is why you'll see these little spirit houses everywhere you go in Thailand. They look something like birdhouses, but they're intended for the spirits who belong in the piece of ground on which the family's dwelling stands. The spirit house is called a prapum. It's placed on a post in the front yard in such a position that the shadow of the human house will never fall on it. From time to time, when Suan thinks the ghosts of the ground need attention, he'll place food and incense in the prapum. The Thais look after their spirit houses out of tradition, belief, and superstition. For these same reasons, their houses also have an odd number of rooms, never an even number. Basically, it's a matter of good luck. The rooms are large and open, with an absolute minimum of cumbersome furniture. The floors are polished and level, and shoes are never worn inside. The house is built on stilts four or five feet above the surface of the ground, because in flood times during the rainy season, the water of the Klongs has been known to come up almost to the porch. Suwan has a special fondness for a space below the house, where the water jars are stored with their fill of rainwater. Suwan finds it pleasant down here, enjoying an hour out of the heat of the day, relaxing on the frame of an old bed, which was put here a forgotten time ago to get it out of the way. Suwan has raised his children according to the gentle beliefs of Thai Buddhism. He believes that each action in life calls for a certain reward or a certain penalty. Therefore, to reach the state of perfect and permanent peace and happiness, good acts, kind acts, generous acts will produce admirable results. Buddhists feel there is no better road to merit than providing food for the monks, who are not permitted to handle money or ask outright for food. Instead, the families in the neighborhood of the Wat take turns in providing the food, bringing it fully prepared and ready to serve. Each family tries to provide the best it possibly can. Because Buddhists believe that the one who does the good deed receives the merit, the family says thank you to the monks as they offer the food. The monks say nothing at all. The monks must not eat after the hour of 12 noon. Their only meal of the day takes place at 11 in the morning. Another way for Buddhists to attain merit is to be present during this meal. The family has not come to worship since there is nothing specific to worship. Buddha never made claims of divinity, but thought of himself merely as a teacher, someone who could point out a gentle way to a more rewarding and calmer life. A few years ago, the monks were responsible for teaching the children in the Wat schools. Now only some of them teach, but they're always at hand. Saffron-colored symbols of the tranquil life, which is the Buddhist ideal. Few of them are monks for life, but instead may serve for as little as three days, or as long as several years. The most popular time for becoming a temporary monk is the Buddhist Lent, which is during the rainy season, the time between sowing and harvest. There isn't much work to do then, and it seems a good time for looking after the next life. As for this life, most of the boy monks will lead lives much like Suan's, tending their fields and their families, their future and their fate. In the comparative security of a country that has known no European master for all its history of more than 1,000 warm, productive years in the Asian sun. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed the first part of Discovery's visit to Thailand. And if you'd like to find out more about this beautiful, ancient, and independent country, then ask your librarian for any one of these books. The Springing of the Rice by Eric Berry, Getting to Know Thailand by Margaret Ayer, and this book, Prapan, A Boy of Thailand, by G. Warren Schlote, Jr. Next week, we'll still be in this nation that used to be known in the world as Siam, but we'll be in a part of it that's far away and totally different. We'll be in a town called Mungao, where the main industry is the harvesting of teak a field in which a great deal of the work is done by intelligent and well-trained elephants. We'll see them in action next week on part two of Discovery Goes to Thailand. So be with us then. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Production Unit's foreign transportation arrangements provided by Alitalia Airlines.
This has been a Jewel's Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs. Let me